listening to episode one of Behind the Bills. I'm Ivan Carrillo, AXA's Senior Director of Policy and Governmental Relations. We're really excited to, to launch this podcast as it's going to be a, a new platform for us to be able to provide you updates on things related to AXA's policy and, and political work. We've heard from, from you loud and clear that there's a desire to hear more regular uh, updates for, from us on what is taking place up here in Sacramento, here in the state capitol, things that may impact your job and, and then the students you serve. We're also going to include just some peeling back uh, of sorts uh, of, of the curtain on different things that, that happen up here within AXA internally, but also externally. Um, just the, the, the day-to-day work that your AXA uh, governmental relations team is engaged in our work with our legislative policy committee, our work with our vice presidents of legislative action, um, broader stakeholders uh, as well, to give you just some insights in, in, into what takes place and how ultimately we are working to influence policy and, and budget decisions on behalf of, of you all, our members, as, as well as, as the students in our public education system. All right, so let's jump right in. We're quickly approaching uh, June 15th, which is the, the constitutional deadline by when the legislature has to pass the state budget. Last year, when the state adopted a budget, they were flying blind. They didn't have accurate revenue information because the federal government delayed tax filing deadlines. Deadlines are normally in April. They were delayed until November. So the legislature had and, and the governor had to estimate what they were going to be dealing with in terms of, of, of revenue. So what we learned after the filings came in was that nearly $9 billion in additional funding was provided to schools. So some are describing this as, a, as an over-appropriation of Prop 98. Prop 98 was a statewide ballot initiative passed in the late 80s, which has set a minimum guarantee of, of funding that would be provided to K through 14 education. It equates to about 40% of the state's budget um, year, uh, year to year. So given that, that Prop 98 was over-appropriated by $9 billion, the governor and the legislature now have a $9 billion problem on their, on their hands that they had to solve for. In January, the governor proposed a, a manipulation of Proposition 98, which allowed essentially schools to retain the money that they should not have gotten but in doing so he was proposing to not utilize that nine billion dollars as part of the calculation for prop 98 and the reason why this is important is because the prop 98 funding level on 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 any given year then sets the floor for for funding levels the following year and so this was going to have uh, long-term effects, billions of dollars um, in, in, in lost revenue uh, for, for schools that would otherwise uh, go to providing direct student supports. So it's a no surprise AXA, AXA was fully opposed to this, and we were joined by other education statewide organizations um, in opposing this manipulation. It was announced last week that the governor reached an agreement with the California Teachers Association to score, though, that $9 billion as part of the Prop 98 guarantee. So a complete reversal in in that regard. In in place, the governor is is partly relying on deferrals, um, is partly relying on maintenance factor, which means uh, schools are guaranteed this money, but it's going to be paid back at a later time. But the important thing to, to know here is that schools are going to be receiving the money that it's owed and that and that schools are going to have billions of dollars and more funding to serve students. This is a, a huge reversal. Um, it's one that the legislature has yet to publicly state that it's in support of, so there's still work to be done here. We're actively lobbying the legislature to to support the governor's proposal here. We are ensuring that we are protecting the integrity of Proposition 98 and therefore um, retaining billions of dollars year in and year out um, for public education. 
a few other items related to the state budget. Uh, the first is is being described as the emergency school closures proposal by the governor. What the governor is proposing is to penalize schools and withhold funding if schools are unable to provide remote learning within five days of an emergency school closure. Whether your schools are closed for wildfire, flood, whatever it may be, if this lasts for five days or longer, you would have to implement and and, and provide remote learning by that fifth day. And if not, you would no longer be able to receive funding for, for students served in your district. AXA members are fired up about this. This was actually uh, one of the primary areas of, of, of focus for legislative action days, where we had 250 members up here in Sacramento talking directly to every single legislature about why this was a bad idea. And so our members have described to us that when you have these emergency school, school closures, you often don't have internet for, for past five days. Not to mention the, 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 the reality is that things are so unstable for the entire school communities. You have students who, whose living situations are often completely disrupted. You have the teachers that are, that are teaching them whose living situations are also disrupted. So the governor is proposing to, find, to take money away from schools for things that are out of schools' hands at the end of the day. That's what it ultimately comes down to. I'm really happy to share that the legislature has heard our message. The legislature, um, as part of its budget actions, rejected the governor's proposal. I want to make sure it's clear that this isn't a done deal. This still has to be negotiated, but that's a really significant um, step here. It's ultimately, again, part of the broader negotiations that are now taking place behind closed doors between legislative leadership and the governor. But the advocacy is working. One last quick thing is related to electric school buses. The governor is proposing nearly $900 million to support replacing diesel school buses with electric school buses. This has been a a big focus of the governor uh, for for years, and there has been investment uh, under his leadership in this area. In January, our members were shocked by this proposal, and at that time it was $500 million. So there's an additional $400 million that was just that was just proposed to be added to it here in the governor's May revise. And our members were shocked about it because there is significant challenge with bringing in electric school buses, particularly for, for rural areas of the state. You have issues related to battery life, performance, maintenance, and a whole host of other issues. As part of our advocacy, we're making it very clear that, that we're, we're in opposition to this. The legislature agrees with us, and the legislature is 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 pushing back on the governor, and and so they they've rejected this proposal uh, as well, and so we're we're hopeful that um, ultimately this funding is not included. All this has to be done by June fifteenth, and so that's the constitutional deadline. The legislature has to pass uh, a balanced budget by that time. We've seen in recent years there are what what we uh, describe as shell budgets that are passed at that time and that budget details are still worked out and, and don't come for, for weeks um, and, and, and sometimes months later. Um, but we will have a lot of answers to, 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 to our questions by, by, by June 15th. Um, the legislature will pass a budget by that time. All right, I'm really excited to bring on the very first guest uh, ever to Behind the Bills, uh, my colleague and friend, Naj Alakan, who's the AXA Senior Director of Marketing and Communications. Welcome, Naj. Thanks, man. This is um, this is a unique opportunity here, you know, because we don't have to be wearing jackets and ties through it, you know, so nobody actually knows that we're wearing like shorts and, and basketball shoes while we're doing <laughs> this. It's like a totally different different environment. So we, you and I can, we can just sit here and, and talk and joke and everything and, and our listeners will have no idea. Yeah, for sure. No, no, no. I, I'm excited to be doing this with you and, and just appreciate you coming on and, 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 and us talking about an area that we've been asked about a lot by, by AXA members. Um, it, it, it happens all the time when, when I'm out in the field, when I talk about our legislative work, 
how does AXA come to positions? I mean, uh, it, or even if folks know about legislative policy committee um, and, and what, how, who are they? Uh, what is their function? And um, what are the conversations that take place and ultimately get us to a position? I mean, it's it's interesting because when 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 we go out and we talk to members, right, especially our our members that are not the ones that are like in leadership assembly and on the board and things like that. These are members that ask, hey, how did AXA come to that position on this particular piece of legislation? Right. And it's not just. I mean, people ask me, so did did Edgar just come up with that? Did Edgar make that decision or did Yvonne make that decision? And there's like a whole process, right, that goes from, you know, the the research done by your department all the way to the board making a, a decision. But like the big piece of this right is legislative policy committee. For sure. No, I appreciate you hitting that right at the front end that these aren't positions that that any of us at the staff level are, are determining on our own, um, that that there are bylaws in place that that dictate a process that's going to be utilized for 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 our positions. And so legislative policy committee is, is one of those bodies and is the primary body um, that determines uh, whether or not we take a formal position on on bills that are introduced by the state legislature. Our board of directors is also has that authority um, and sometimes does intervene and sometimes does um, uh, for really high profile controversial bills. Um, it's our board of directors sometimes that steps in and, and, and makes that determination. Um, but I know we're going to focus primarily on our on our on our LPC um, because again they, they do this work and so Maybe I can start because I think it's important with our our one voice for students legislative platform because that's really our North Star. Every legislative session, there's a lot of work that goes into developing our platform. Right. Uh, and we go through months of work here at the staff level of engaging our, our committees, our councils, um, and our regions to get input on what is most pressing um, and what are the, 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 what are the greatest challenges and opportunities at, at school sites um, and where they believe access should focus its attention. And so we ultimately adopt this One Voice for Students um, legislative platform that is then utilized by us on the governmental relations team and our legislative policy committee to, to as a North Star, um, and guiding us to an ultimate uh, position. And, and what's the longevity of this one voice platform? Because I mean, like, do you guys have to go through this every single year? Is it something that lasts for like three or four years? Like, how, but what, what's the cadence on that? So we go through a whole rewrite every two years. And, and so that's aligned to the two year legislative cycle, legislative sessions that take place. But every year, um, we uh, make revisions and updates to make sure that we are reflecting current context. A lot changes in, from, from one year to the next. Um, so to make sure that ours is reflective of the most up-to-date p- policy and political context, we, we update it every year. And so that happens in the late fall and then is adopted by our leadership assembly at its first meeting of the year in February. Okay. All right. So then, so you've got your one voice right? That is on a two year cycle and you revise it annually. Correct. Based on issues and legislation and all of that. So you've got your one voice platform and there's a lot, correct? There's a lot of research that goes into that by you and all of the governmental relations advocates. I mean that it, that to come to a, a, a plan a two-year plan, you guys have to put a lot of like sweat equity into the research part, right? Yeah, for sure. And the research is is engagement with members, it, it is getting in front of our, our councils and our committees, our board of directors, and 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 going through exercises to to tease out things that are, um, again, 
most pressing in, in school sites up and down the state? Where, where are the opportunities for us to, to, to better serve students in our public education system? And then figuring out where the commonalities are. We're, we're a big organization made up of very diverse membership that come, I mean, that, uh, and so us looking at the responses and seeing where there are areas of commonality and pulling that out is, is, is a laborious like effort in and of itself. Yeah. So then, so you've got your platform approved by our leadership assembly, which is like about 200 members statewide. Um, and then that goes, so what's the next step after that? Then it goes to ledge policy committee. Then there's more research. Like what's, what's step two? Yeah. After approved by our leadership assembly, it goes to our board of directors for, for final adoption. Um, and, and then it's, then again, it's, it's, it's uplifted. Um, and within our legislative policy committee, as we, as we engage in our work. Our legislative policy committee is made up of representatives from each of AXA's uh, councils. It's made up of, of representatives from every one of the, the 19 regions that make up AXA uh, as well. Um, and so really trying to make sure, again, that all voices within our, in all areas uh, of our state and, and, and voices in terms of our um, different job alikes um, are, are part of this uh, process. Um, so they, they um, I mean, I guess maybe, does it make sense to walk through the, just yeah, what, I uh, mean, what the cause, bill process is? Because like what point? you, so like what, uh, I, I guess the vision that I'm having, right? Because um, I haven't been into alleged policy committee meeting since like, pre pre pandemic right so i'm imagining it's it's like almost imagining that there's like the biggest um biggest conference room table that you can possibly imagine with everybody sitting in you know just in these seats almost like it's an interview style like take me in the room what is this like cuz i can't imagine that a lot of work would get done if you put every single person into one room and try to, to to discuss legislation or one voice or anything like that like what's it like so for 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 most of the um, bill conversations we're actually broken up into two subcommittees and so you have subcommittees split up um, primarily based on expertise um, where we want to make sure that somebody who is providing input and information and, and reaction to a bill related to, you know, I mean, curriculum and instruction, that they have that background, that again, that they have that expertise, that they represent our curriculum and instruction council and are tapped into to, to those members of ours. And so we have two different subcommittees, again, um, that, that, that have a focus in terms of the issue areas um, the, the, the bill topics. And then our staff um, identifies bills, our government and relations team. We sift through thousands of bills, narrow it down each legislative cycle, and we bring the ones um, that, are, that are most critical um, and the, the most important. Um, so we're, we're, we're often identifying it um, sometimes our members bring these bills to our attention too and uplift them and, and, and want to make sure that they're being discussed. And so that happens as well. And so we're in two different subcommittees and one by one, we, we present these bills um, and we get feedback um, from them. Um, it's not a, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, what's most important from these conversations isn't whether we support or oppose it's really about the nuances. What are the implications or what, what um, of, of policy that's being proposed that's so often missed by, by lawmakers and staff? What do they need to know to improve a bill to make it better? Um, or what are they not considering that makes it a bad bill? So, so then once it comes, once the discussions happen, right in in ledge policy committee once the discussions happen 
So wh- how do you how do you decide on how to advocate for a bill? How do you decide we're going to send this to the board of directors? We've made this decision, and we're going to send it to the board of directors for their approval, right? Do you take like a hand vote? I mean, how do you? Is it majority? Like, what what's the decision process? Most often, there's there's consent or unanimous feelings on on on, on what the course of action should be. Um, but we do operate in in a, in a majority rules fashion. That's how that's what our bylaws dictate. And so there are examples where sometimes we have to take a vote because it's just clear that there, there's there's divided um um you know i mean take on 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 a particular proposal um but once it's once it's determined what our position is going to be um it's 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 often relied upon the expertise of our governmental relations team to figure out how do we get to the end goal Mm -hmm. our members told us that that this bill is bad and we need to prevent this from happening um, how are we going to get there? And it, it, it's different for, for, for every single bill. There are so many factors at play. Sometimes we can do that behind the scenes, and we never have to be public about a position. We see that every single year. Um, some years it requires us to be the face and to be front and center in our opposition or, or in support and be in committee. Or, or, or to be writing uh, press releases and quotes and, 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 and opinion articles. And um, so it and, and honestly just depends. Um, there, are, there are lots of factors. Um, relationships is probably one of the primary ones. Um, our, our, our team is, is really, really effective. And, and, and part of that reason is because of the relationships they have with legislators, with legislative staff, and with different um, um, stakeholders, um, with different organizations, and so uh, utilizing those relationships to 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 fix problems, to to move forward things we feel good about. Um, but every single bill looks different. So then, after a decision is made, goes to the board, board of directors, they vote, yay or nay. Well, the the board rarely gets involved. It actually the the alleged policy committee is is an authoritative body to okay. make the decisions okay so each legislative session we usually have one or two bills that goes to the board of directors but that's few and far between is there usually a comedian among the lpc is there usually somebody who who's kind of lighthearted and and all of that or is everybody just nose to the grindstone all of that because i i have to imagine being inside those meetings the discussion is is pretty substantive. Like like there's, like there's they they're there for a reason. But like, are there moments of levity in there? There are moments of levity for okay. sure. I won't I won't call out any names. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's I, 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 yeah for sure. And it almost there almost has to be some of that. Um, but but I think there's also a recognition like that that that. I think our 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 legislative policy committee understands like. These these words that in a bill, the uh, every single one of them matter in terms of of of, of what a pu- specific policy is going to require or or not require. Um, so yeah, don't get me wrong. It, there's there's a lot there's a, it's a lot of business in there. I mean, we ask a lot of our legislative policy committee members, and um, and they respond. They 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 do incredible work, and and a key part of that is them getting input from the groups that they represent going back to their regions Mm -hmm. saying what do you think about this bill we're going to be discussing it next week as part of our alleged policy committee going back to their councils and doing that so they're not representing themselves they're representing a broader portion of our membership and uplifting those voices very cool very cool what hey i i appreciated the run through because again i haven't been inside an lpc meeting in forever probably since before you came to axa originally and so i i feel like i now understand a little bit more about how that works and the next time you invite me in for this podcast all right i want to actually see 
the three most impressive people that you have in your contacts list on your phone <laughs> from from across the street? Because I can tell you, as a sports fan, there was a time when I had both Emmett Smith, all-time leading rusher in NFL history, and Richard Dent, the Super Bowl twenty MVP from the Bears, in my contact list. And then that phone... I was gonna say, what happened to that? Number. Yeah, that phone that blew phone. up on me, and I and I never never kept those. And you know what? They probably changed those numbers anyway. But they were legit. They were legit numbers. So this next guy time, Naj keeps calling me. I don't know who the <laughs> hell he is. So next time, I want to see what 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 contacts you got on your phone. I'll show you the contacts. Yeah. I don't I don't know contacts. Right. I I, uh, I won't show you the the text exchange. Or Perfect. Whatever. That'll work. <laughs> Thanks, Naj. I appreciate you coming on and, and, and digging into that a little bit. Thanks for having me. All right, that's it for episode one of Behind the Bills. On behalf of everyone I'm here on the team that, that, that was involved in this project, I'm Ivan Carrillo, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.